Well, it happened. In the midst of all of our decorations and gift exchanges and cookie baking and cocktail making, it happened. In the midst of people all over the world traveling by plane, train, and automobile, it happened. In the midst of the Broncos having a subpar season, it happened. In the midst of our government going through a shutdown, it happened. In the midst of people living on the streets of Denver in single degree temperatures and people trying to cross borders and walls all over the world, it happened. In the midst of your loved one's illness, it happened. In the midst of whatever is going on in your home or your work life, it happened. And yes, in the midst of your resolutions to exercise more and sleep more and go to church more, while eating less and worrying less and working less, it happened. Jesus was born. Yep, go tell it on the mountain. Out of the pages of this sacred text and into our world, Jesus was born again. So have you taken this newborn babe home from the hospital? I mean, manger yet? Are you getting any sleep? I mean, are you adjusting to how this baby is rocking your world, drawing every ounce of your attention and every ounce of your energy and making you realize that you don't really understand just how deep love could go? Or did you, did you leave Jesus at the, on the manger here on the chancel on Christmas Eve? Content maybe to visit him once a week for an hour or two. I mean, you don't need to hear his every coo and cry or see him learn to waddle or walk. You'll just catch the highlights when you're here on Sundays. You see, if Jesus was a literal baby born into our lives that we were expected to take home and care for, our lives would be changed forever, wouldn't they? They would have a whole new orientation. We would tilt and revolve on the axis of the Christ child. But he's not a real baby, to us anyway, today. He's in our hearts, right? Not in our homes. Now, a real baby you can't just forget about. They won't let you forget about them. They will cry. Jesus is a different kind of baby. Yeah, he does not want us to forget about him. He even gives us this meal here that we'll take today, saying, do this in remembrance of me. But he's not going to throw a temper tantrum if we neglect him. He does not demand our attention and love. He desires it. And not for his own sake, but for the sake of others and the world. This means that we have to figure out how to make Jesus real for our lives every year all over again. He's not going to do it for us, and it's going to take some seeking and some searching on our part. When I was home last week in Texas, my nephews, ages five and two, wanted to play hide and seek with me, which was great. Uh, they wanted to play it over and over and over again, uh, which we did, except that each time we played, they started counting faster and faster. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ready or not, here we come. Or they just started skipping numbers. One, three, five, seven, ten. Ready or not, here we come. Or they just didn't even bother to get to ten at all. One, two, three, four. Ready or not, here we come. I mean, I was not ready. I could barely even get out of the room that they were in, let alone hide. I needed more time, but it did not matter to William and Jack. They just kept giggling and counting faster and faster, and I was never ready for them. Do you ever feel that way with Jesus? Because ready or not, here he comes. No matter what is going on in our lives or in the world, whether or not we have time to devote to him, I mean, couldn't he wait until things settle down at work or until the home renovation is done or until the treatment is over? But ready or not, here he comes. And the thing about Jesus is that when we mark time by the life of Jesus, it doesn't matter what is going on in our lives or in the world or if we're ready or not. Jesus' life goes on. 
His birth, his ministry, his death, his resurrection. Every year, we cycle through these events as a church, and we replay Jesus' life in the midst of our lives with the hope that somehow something will change. Yet, if the events of Jesus' life are just playing like a broken record on repeat, we all know what happens. We tune it out. We stop listening. We leave the baby in the manger, and we head to the mall to exchange our gifts. What if it didn't have to be that way? What if instead of replaying Jesus' life in the midst of our lives, we saw our lives as happening around his. You see, yes, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, does mean that God came to earth to walk and talk and be with us, that God cares deeply about what is going on in our lives, and Jesus did not fix all the woes of his day just by showing up. And why is that? Because it's not Jesus' job to fix all of our woes. Sure, he brings love, he brings grace, reconciliation, and healing. He doesn't bring super glue and duct tape and the latest, greatest, all-in-one power tool. It's not Jesus' job to fix all our woes. It's our job to fixate on Jesus so that we stop or at least slow down our woes, so that we stop seeing other people as them and instead see all people as us, so that we stop creating greed and envy by worshiping wealth and power and instead become satisfied in spirit by serving others and sharing what we have, so that we stop building an idol out of work and busyness and instead create time for relationships and community so that we stop seeing suffering as punishment or as a result of, quote, something we must have done to deserve this, and instead see suffering as really one of the great teachers of our lives, as something that is part of the human condition, not an abnormality, but a normality. Suffering will happen. It's as universal as breathing. So what would our world look like if we were to stop waiting on Jesus to fix all of our problems and instead were to fixate on Jesus so that we began to see solutions. You see, Epiphany is the season in which we look for the showing forth or the revelation of Christ in the world. And we begin this season today by recalling the journey of these wise ones, these astrologers or scholars from the East, and, and they go to seek the Christ child. They fixate on a star until it stops above a manger, and then they worship and give thanks and give Jesus gifts. And after that experience, this epiphany of God's presence made real right in front of them, they have their own epiphany, their own moment of revelation. And that moment does not fix everything, but it does fix something. I'll come back to that. First, I just want to remind all of us that there was nothing perfect about the circumstances of Jesus' birth. Not just for Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, but remember the world around them. Circumstances were bleak. Jesus was born into a time of political and religious upheaval. Herod was an insecure and power-hungry man, he was creating a dangerous environment for anyone who threatened him, and his actions and his reactions showed little regard for human life. In fact, when the Magi come and ask him, you know, quote, where is the king of the Jews, he goes into such a jealous rage that just verses after what we read today, he orders what is known as the massacre of the innocents, the murder of all children two years old and younger. You see, Jesus came into the world in a very specific time in history that was far from perfect or peaceful. It was actually quite horrific. And yet, in all of that chaos around them, all that they could not understand, the wise ones knew enough to know that they didn't know it all. So they set out to search, and they took a risk. They set out to look for a child that they did not know anything about and that wasn't even one of their own, so to speak. Ruth Haley Barton says that we're all seekers in this life, and none of us does it perfectly. 
But our seeking is really about a longing that we have for something more of God than what we're experiencing right now. And and like the wise ones, this longing compels us to move beyond the borders of life as we know it in order to discover a deeper spiritual reality. And this is the story of the wise ones. As Richard Rohr says, a good journey begins with knowing where we are and being willing to go somewhere else. You see, the wise ones knew who they were. They were experts in astrology, and at this point, they traveled far enough. I'm going to give them the credit and say they were experts at travel as well. And yet they listened to whatever it was that warned them in a dream to go home by another road. They changed their plans based on something new that they learned, something that they had to be open to hear, something they didn't ignore. And their humility in listening to that dream and not assuming that they knew the best way to travel because they had just traveled the best way, their humility in listening and in course correcting changed the story. Not for every child, tragically, but for one child, thankfully. They could not change Herod's terror by fixating on Jesus. Herod was still a brutal killer. Yet by fixating on Jesus and the awe and wonder that he instilled in them, they could change their own hearts, their own minds, their own ability to listen and to learn. And it made a difference for one child. They had an epiphany moment of their own. And you know what I wonder about is that do they even know the result of their moment? That by them going home by another road that it spared Jesus' life? We don't know. The spiritual life is like that. When we fixate on Jesus, we don't always get to see what things are fixed because of us, right? We're just faithful and we follow and we care more about doing what is right than who is right. So we're moving into this new year and we have a new set of spiritual practices in our yes and theme passion and humility. Yes, you feel what you feel, or you know what you know, and you can practice humility. You see, our emotions and our passions are what make us who we are. To be passionate about a person or a cause or a value is a great thing. To be knowledgeable about a certain area of expertise is wonderful. And yet it's important for us to remember that what might be our passion is not necessarily everybody else's passion. Have you ever got caught in a conversation with someone where they're talking on and on about something and you have no idea what they're talking about, nor do you really care a lick about what they're talking about, but they keep going? They're passionate. We've probably all been that person before, and we've probably all been the person listening. You see, when we look at someone else's passion and we have no idea why they care about that issue or cause, it is good for us to take a step back in humility and seek to learn from them why they are passionate about that. What do they see that we have yet to see? The season of Epiphany is about seeing differently, about discovering something new about God, and in turn, about ourselves, or the reverse. Sometimes we discover something new about ourselves, and it allows us to see God in a whole new light. Like the wise ones, when we have an epiphany in our life, it often helps us have humility because we learn something about ourselves, something about the world that is new to us. Perhaps we're corrected or we're redirected. Our previous held beliefs are are changed ever so slightly, and it changes our path. Now, for a long time, I thought of epiphany as something that had to be this instantaneous moment of revelation. Does anybody think of epiphany in that way? Like a a light bulb moment going out? Okay, a couple of you. Y'all are wiser than I am. You know, I I used to think of it as this thing that would just happen, but I started thinking of it after I, I read some things as maybe the way scientists think about the word eureka. Do you know the history of the word eureka? You don't. Tom Way- if Tom Waymeyer doesn't know the history of Eureka, then let me tell you. So when people exclaim Eureka, what they're doing is they're reenacting this uh, legendary event in the life of a Greek mathematician and inventor named Archimedes. 
And Archimedes was wrestling with the problem of how to determine the purity of gold. And he took a break from all of his academic wrestling, and he went into one of those public bathhouses they have back then. And when he stepped into the bath, he realized that the same amount of water that his legs took up is the same amount of water that came out of the bath, the same amount of water that was dispersed. So he suddenly had this revelation that the buoyancy of an object placed in water is equal in magnitude to the weight of the water that the object displaces. I don't understand any of that, but what I do understand is that this moment came to him at a time when he wasn't actively wrestling with this question. And the reason it's called Eureka is because the legend goes he jumped up out of the bath and ran naked through the town saying, Eureka, Eureka, I have found it. So a lot of the most powerful ideas in the history of science are actually Eureka moments, and they've done studies on this. Scientist Carl Albrecht says the so-called Eureka moment is the culmination of a pre-conscious process known as incubation. Incubation is a stage in which the thinker has temporarily set aside his or her attempts to solve a problem and is turned to other thoughts. But behind the scenes, the brain is still working. Have you had this experience where you can't figure something out and then you go away and all of a sudden it comes to you? They've actually done uh, surveys on this with scientists about when, where their eureka moments happened. Here are the top 10 places they happened. Uh, showering, uh, number one. Sleeping or dreaming, number two. Driving, walking, um, especially when you're walking a dog, apparently. Uh, working out and running uh, right before you go to sleep, right after you wake up. Talking to others alone. Only 0.6% of the eureka moments in this study happened in like a work setting where people were actively thinking about the problem they were wrestling with. All of this says that sometimes it's good for us to stop wrestling so hard and to step away and allow things to breathe. Now, to be sure, they still had to go to work, right? You still have to be at work to get the right things that go in the incubator. You can't just not do the behind the scenes stuff. A spiritual way to think about this is to realize that while coming to worship and church school and praying and reading your Bible and serving in some capacity may seem like at times that it's not getting you anywhere, maybe think of it as an incubation period like a spiritual conditioning to prepare you for the moment of eureka that might come. You see, epiphanies happen when we know what is already true to us, but we have the ability to see it in a different light, to imagine something differently, to expand our hearts, to re-examine something. And the good news of the season of epiphany is to remind us that God can show up anywhere and everywhere to anyone, even you. And even Jesus, the greatest epiphany of all, the greatest sign of God's presence in the world, had an incubation period. It was in the womb for nine or ten months, we suppose. You see, as we look at these themes of passion and humility, we remember that with passion comes a great drive to learn and to know and to be engaged with what we're already passionate about but that also we need to take a step back sometimes and listen to others and hear what else is going on, that there might be another way. There's a Chinese proverb that says, be like the bamboo. The higher you grow, the deeper you bow. The next two months, we're encouraging you to do two things. The first is to dive more deeply into something you're already passionate about. And the second is to join in with somebody you know, a friend or a family member, that's passionate about something that you really either don't like or don't know a lot about. Go along with them. Ask them about why they love that. In this way, we open our minds and our hearts to something more expansive, even perhaps a way of expanding the way we see God. I leave you with this wonderful example from C.S. Lewis, from the second book in the Chronicles of Narnia. Prince Caspian. The children are lost in Narnia, and they're trying to figure out how to get into Prince Caspian's camp. And Lucy, the little girl, experiences a personal visit from the great Aslan. 
And Aslan, up to this point, has been invisible to her siblings. As Lucy encounters her old friend, she somehow perceives him to be bigger than she remembers from past experiences. And she says, Aslan, you're bigger. That's because you're older, little one. Not because you're bigger. I am not bigger. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. You see, a good rule of thumb for knowing whether or not you've had an epiphany, a eureka moment, is have you grown? Does that moment somehow expand your heart, expand your vision? Does it somehow cause you to risk a little more? Does it somehow cause you to put aside fear and go toward love? If so, eureka. Amen.